Welcome to the Industry Experts Panel at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com. My name is Michelle Holliday. Today, we are welcoming back to the show Mr. David Morgan. David is a precious metals expert. He holds degrees in both finance and engineering. He is the publisher of the Morgan Report, where he specializes in money, metals, and mining. David has been featured everywhere, including CNBC, Fox Business News, The Wall Street Journal, it goes on and on, and we are so excited to have him back today to get his perspectives on what our future is looking like as the value of fiat currency continues to dive into the abyss as the printing goes on and precious metals take center stage. David, welcome back to the show. How are you today? I'm well, Michelle, and thanks for having me back. Oh, we are thrilled, and we're excited for this show at this time. It's just, it's crazy. Let's start off, though, with fiat money, Dave. The financial crisis looks very similar to 2008 in many ways, and we have deflated a super debt bubble. In order to save businesses and individuals from going under, the governments and central banks have pledged over 12 trillion dollars. Back in 2008, this type of action resulted in a reflation period, which was great for inflationary assets. Do you feel like the same scenario is setting itself up right now, or is this completely different? Well, I think the basics are the same. I mean, the basic premise I've started with is quite simple. All fiat fails. So that's what, three words? And that's a fact. And of course, I've gotten some pushback that, you know, the dollar won't and the central banks are in charge and we have technology and there's lots of excuses, but you can't live a lie forever, which is fiat money, which means you get something for nothing. And I've said that probably in every interview I've ever done. So back to the direct question. Yeah, it's different. In 2008, it was something that the banks had the ability to basically paper over. There wasn't really substantive change as far as uh, productive capacity in the physical economy. There were some improvements, but most were rather modest. The big input, of course, was free cash to the elite, which meant that we went on this massive stock buyback program and corporate uh, entities went into the corporate bond market floated their debt at um, very low rates, which gave them a bunch of cash to buy back their own stock, which gave them bigger bonuses. So it's been a basically repeat of the Roman Empire on a massive scale where the, the Republic no longer exists. The, uh, the upper class, political class and banking class basically are uh, feathering their own nests at the expense of the public. The public sees that stock prices are going up they're going along for the ride. I'm not discounting the fact that the price of the stock's going up. What I am questioning is what is the true value of that? And the answer is nothing close to what the pricing mechanism has done because it's broken. So now we're in a situation where it's not going to work. That's the difference between 2008 and, and right now. In 2008, there's more savvily, savvy and tune people or, or investors, I'll say, I'll use the word investors, be them retail or, or sovereign wealth funds or money managers or hedge funds or <clears throat> Wall Street itself, knew that by printing that much money, it was going to be inflationary. Inflation is a easy definition in the Austrian school. It's an increase in the money supply. So we've had massive inflation. What the people that are uh, correctly uh, diagnosing it is like Jim Rickers, who I respect his thinking greatly, is you can have inflation, it can increase the money supply, but unless the velocity of money increases, it isn't apparent to the general public. Although going a step further, shadowstats.com, John Williams, proves beyond a shadow of a doubt, I mean, it's not the hamburger index, that's one that people can look up on the internet, but basically we're at about a 10% inflation, regardless of what the government tells us the inflation rate is. Back on point, we're at a point where now, no matter how much money they print, it's not going to work. That doesn't mean you won't get ups and, you know, back and forth in the stock market, you'll get these big rallies, I'll call them relief rallies, but basically you want to do the opposite of what we did from 2008 to 2019, which is by the dip, what you want to do is you want to sell the rally. So overall, the huge shift will be down in the stock market, generally speaking, 
the world economy has been contracting for months and months and months. I put that on almost every podcast I do every weekend. And it's provable, it's provable in the mainstream if you know where to look. And so we're going to see a situation where over time there'll be a run to gold. It'll start as a walk. It'll start as a hedge. It'll start as, you know, guys and people that are in, let's say, the professional uh, Wall Street industry starts quietly moving into gold, and then uh, it'll become a jog, and then it'll become a run, and then it'll become an all-out sprint. And once the sprint has started, it will be beyond repair. In other words, a lot of the gold that will be obtainable will be unobtainable. It will be swapped gold. It will be hypothecated gold. It will be leased gold. And so I'm actually bullish on the miners almost no matter what happens. And I'm not going to explain it now. I'm still thinking about it. I'll put it in this, this weekend's uh, Morgan report. But it's what I've always said would happen, and I believe it is beginning, which is the premise that governments can't fail is ridiculous. Uh, there's a very bright gentleman that wrote a book after the 2008 crisis. One of my friends from Canada sent it to me and had me read it. I didn't finish it because his premise was incorrect. I mean, I'm not a super fan of Ayn Rand, but she does say check your premises. And his basic premise is that government doesn't fail. They can always bail you out. That's what I call the big daddy syndrome. Big daddy is going to take care of everything. I don't have to worry about anything. It's replacing, you know, it's replacing a man with God, basically. I mean, it's like man has a lot of control, but not ultimate control. There's what's called natural law, if you don't believe in God. But natural law has a way of coming to the fore. And again, if you can't get something for nothing and you're printing all these pieces of paper and sending them to China and getting real goods, how long can that last? And the answer is not forever. So we're at a point where governments will start to fail. We probably see the EU break up further. You see sort of an every man for himself attitude that you haven't seen in a long time. The globalists have all been about, you know, one world currency, one world religion, one world economic system basically global control and they have the, the power to set the dial wherever they want. Certainly that push has not ended and you're certainly seeing it, but what you're not seeing to my rather studied view is <clears throat> human nature. It's herding cats. Once things get scarce, scarce, food gets scarce, real money like gold and silver gets scarce, businesses that actually are still up and running producing needs, not wants, get scarce. You can have a whole shift in psychology that most people are not psychologically fit to undertake. Because going back to, let's say, nature and starting over, and that's the extreme case. I'm not saying we're doing that. But it is going to be a couple steps down from where we were just in the middle of 2019. And it will be pretty much global in nature. There will be pockets that really won't be affected that much. But generally speaking, it's a big time change. And and chance favors the prepared mind, one of my favorite quotes. And if you're not mentally prepared for a change in lifestyle that will be different from this point forward for a long time, then you're ill-prepared. Wow. You know, this leads directly into my next question, which was, um, do you think that this is a situation between – we have a combination that um, is unique – uh, to put it mildly, um, we have the printing of our currency in such an outrageous way, trillions of dollars every day. Where it's going, no one really explains to us. Secondly, we have the coronavirus that shut down uh, businesses throughout the world. We have millions and millions of people out of work right now that are behind on their mortgages, their food. Uh, we have supply chains that are breaking down. Do you think with this equation and I think you answered it, um, but I'd like you to go into it just a little bit, um, that we will bounce back swiftly, meaning within a month or two, because it does seem like there has been some resurrection of the economy over the past couple of days, especially with the stock market. China also resurrected quickly. Or do you think this is going to be a lasting change on our country? Well, that will that's what I'm going to be writing about in the report, and I'm not trying to sell more reports. I'd like it, but that's not my point. So if you could tell me the duration, I can give you the answer. So if we bounce back within, let's say, the next two weeks to four weeks, it'll probably take two quarters, maybe three, to be back on track. The back on track will be different, noticeably different, but not, 
you know, it's like instead of getting a hundred percent on the quiz, you were at, you know, 80% or, or 85, maybe you're going to see a degradation and things that you took for granted that just aren't there anymore or that you can't get them. So that would be based on duration. But if this thing goes more than let's say three months, four months, I think at that point we're talking a whole different scenario. Then we're in the a situation where the supply chain breakdown, the amount of business failures, the amount of defaults, the amount of people that can't make ends meet, and on and on. All the scenarios you outlined, Michelle, will continue, and and that's going to be much more devastating. So if you could tell me the duration, I could give you a better idea, not exact, but a pretty good idea of how bad it's going to be. Well, um, I'm going to digress a moment, but. Um, the book, and I forget the gentleman's name, it's an excellent book, but The Collapse of Complex Societies. I mean, he went all the way back to, you know, Byzantine, Mesopotamia. He talked to every empire you can think of that we know of in recorded history and why they failed. And I was looking for kind of that key on, you know, why ours would fail, right? And really, I thought about the book, and I, you know, like to think I'm a good thinker, but... Uh, Put it down, I really haven't come to any conclusion because in the book, they had academics explain each empire and why it was agriculture. It was war. It was weather. I mean, there were different scenarios, and it all made sense. But the conclusion is probably easily obtained without reading the book. And the real conclusion that I grasped from it is it doesn't matter what the, the, the start is, really. It's once a civilization starts down, it just doesn't come back. Now, I don't want to be, a, you know, a Cassandra, prophet of doom and saying, you know, it's all over and, you know, go out and slit your wrists. I'm not saying that. What I am suggesting is, one, what I've already said, it's going to be different. It could be marginally different, maybe 10%, 15% different, or it could be cut in half or worse if it goes for a long duration, meaning that the United States at all looks a lot more like a third world country than it ever has in, you know, in, in a long, long time. Again, I'm not forecasting that, but again, chance favors the prepared mind. If your mindset is that, you know, if I have to start living like I did when I was in college and I have to downsize and eat less and have one car instead of two and on and on and on, and you're mentally prepared for that, then you have a much better chance of, you know, smiling once in a while <laughs> and carrying on. But if you're addicted to everything that you own and that defines you, then you've, you're probably going to have a problem in the future, regardless of whether it's shallow or deep. Right. I think it hits those people harder who have done extraordinarily well because they're so used to it, and also their children, because they've never had to stand up, earn anything, they don't even know how, and they're used to being, um, uh, I guess, uh, wrapped in a certain um, lifestyle that protects them from everything. And the fact of the matter is, um, in countries like Venezuela or other places, we've seen where um, it really doesn't matter how much money you have if the grocery store is empty. Exactly. You know? I've made that point many times about the gold bugs. And excuse the digression again, but I said, you know, I'm, I'm a carnivore. Uh, I don't eat meat every day, but let's say, you know, it's been three months since I've had a steak. So I'm willing to give up one Krug, whatever the value is of gold at that time, probably very high, just for a steak. You know, it's like, God, the guy's out of his mind, but I just crave one so bad, okay? Well, if there's no steak to be had, it doesn't matter if I give three, four, five ounces of gold for one, you know, piece of meat. If it doesn't exist, I can't buy it at any price. Exactly your point. I just want to emphasize it. And this is the idea that I want to get across to people, the idea that, you know, grapes from South America in the middle of December are in every grocery store in the United States. That may be a corny example, but that's the kind of idea I want you to think about. Probably not going to be there, you know, next year. You know, stuff that we just don't even think about that we've had it's so good for so long for so many. And now when we start, the pendulum starts swinging the other way and it's less stuff in the store. Oh, well, I can do without that. And then, you know, a month later, there's less stuff and there's less choices. And the next month, there's even less choices. And, you know, the store starts to shrink, not the physical dimensions, but the shelves are spaced out further. I mean, you know, this is the most likely scenario. Is it the end of the world? No. Is it a different world? Yes. Yeah. It's real interesting, um, the long-term effects of supply chains and growing crops. And when it's interrupted, 
People think they're just going to bounce back, but they don't understand the cycles that it takes to grow crops and, you know, the ingredients that go into things. You know, you have a loaf of bread on the shelf. Well, what it what did it take to get that loaf of bread? You had the ingredients that were shipped from the farmer whose crops were affected. And then you have the packaging person who maybe wasn't able to get his packaging from China or wherever he had it. And then you have the trucker that maybe can't, for whatever reason, cross whatever bridge and they don't have the money to fix it. You know what I mean? There are so many variables. There are random variables that can lead to, right. And that's what people don't realize, don't look at and completely take for granted while they're watching whatever television show they're watching, (laughs) which is fine. (laughs) Well, you just did a great job of explaining complex societies. It's not like, you know, I go out, grow the wheat and, you know, my kids, you know, grind it up and uh, my wife bakes it, you know. I mean, that's like old school agrarian agriculture, farming your own. Now, I think a loaf of bread, if I remember correctly, touches 13 different hands before it gets on the shelf of the store. So that's complex society. That's, that's complicated because there can't be any disruption in all those 13 places. And I may be wrong, but at least the idea is sound. So you did a great job of it, illustrating and bread's pretty simple staple you know we're not talking you know some exotic fruit or you know other stuff that we see you know in the grocery store whatever yeah it's that that big picture that people uh i think they don't i don't even think they they miss it so much as they've never even been educated on it (laughs) they're so busy talking about transgender so anyway um moving back to the fact that you are um a precious metals expert and your expertise is in silver the physical supply of silver um, for investment purposes right now is under very severe constraints do you think that we will see silver prices start to explode soon due to the fact that the supply is becoming so much more limited still bullish on silver i think it's going to take some time Uh, we may get a lull for a while but there'll be pressure. I mean, there'll be the run to gold first. I've been convinced of that now for many months and do it on almost all my public interviews and in my private work. But if you're going to call, if you're worried about the situation at hand and you're like a stock person and that's all you've had for your whole retirement planning and all of a sudden you wake up, you're probably going to want some gold. So you call up, and there's no gold available. So then you're going to go to silver and there's no silver available. Then you go to platinum and forget palladium. It's been basically out of touch for a long time. So it will spill over into silver. And then uh, even the hedge fund or whatever might say, you know, I'm taking a small portion of silver. I just did an interview with uh, Nick Bereshev. He founded BMG, a boy on management group in Canada. And they are basically a precious metals holding company. And he has different funds, but basically they've got like gold, silver, platinum as one. And he and I did this talk on my mastermind, and he said basically if one major pension fund decided to diversify 5% of their assets in the gold, it's basically game over. So think about how many pension funds of size are out there that might want to, you know, we recommend 10%. Rickards recommends 10%. I mean, a lot of people think, you know, I mean, the Ibbotson study shows 15%. Jeff Christian from 1968 on said 25% was the, the best amount of gold to hold to balance the portfolio. So take your pick, 10%, 15 25 it doesn't matter. The point is, even if a modest amount like 5% were allocated into the gold market, uh, just the price would just be bid up to an astronomical level. Now, if you t- take that into the silver market, I mean, it's beyond belief because right now of all the financial assets globally, about 1% are in the, in the gold market. I'm talking gold total, not gold stocks, which is still pitifully small. Silver is 0.02%, 0.02%. So think of how little money would come in. This is where, you know, the bankers have a little problem on the silver market, gold as well, but you know, people that are, in the financial survival mode will get whatever they can. And when they start to feel that, you know, they won't announce it as government's failing, they'll see it as the fiat is failing. And when the fiat fiat's failing, they'll go to whatever they can. And of course they'll go to food first and as they should, 
but people that have, you know, excess, meaning, you know, they've got their food or they feel that they do and they need to save capital because the stock market's going down, the bond market's going down, the real estate market's going down. They can't get what they want. They can't do what they want. They're going to look for something of substance. And the only thing that really lasts, let's say, as a legacy investment is precious metals, land, and basically fine art. That's it. You don't have a lot of choices. So if you want to pass something on to your grandchildren's grandchildren about the most stable thing you can do long term, I'm not talking short term swings, is precious metals or land. Yeah. You know, Dave, it's surprising that institutional investors ignore precious metals for the most part. You know what I mean? I mean, it's fortunate for those of us that want to purchase them, but it's shocking um, how, I don't even want to put it out there, I don't want to give an idea <laughs> right, to an institutional investor because they could come in and just wipe it clean, right? Yeah, right. Wow, that's crazy. Now, um, I want to talk about the ratio between gold and silver, and I'm wondering if the supply uh, limitation on silver is going to change the ratio between gold and silver. It's been historically crazy. What are your thoughts? Well, I've you know, looked at it as much as anyone probably, and in all of recorded history for like 5,500 years, the gold-silver ratio only went to 101 a couple times, and now we've been above 120. Every time we've gone to 100 or so, there's been a financial crisis. So with that line of thinking, it's not pure logic. It's not really logical, but it does suggest that, that this would portend the biggest financial crisis. So there's that. They spot, they're usually spikes, or they have been spikes in the past, which suggests this one will be a spike. Last time in 2008, when we had the crisis, the precious metals bottom for 106 days. So that's what, three and a half months, something like that. And so I think this will be even shorter. I mean, gold basically got walloped uh, down to like, what, 1,500-ish or something. It got below 1,550, I remember that. It only stayed there a couple of days. And now we're back up above 1,600. So gold's definitely doing this job. Silver will fall off for the reasons we already discussed. And it will, um, I think, still outperform gold. You'll see that gold-silver ratio go from the, the peak of one, I don't know what the peak is, really, 133, I, I don't know. But wherever it was, <clears throat> it'll come down back to 100, back to 80, 70, 60, 50, 40. I think it could get into really advantageous to silver people, meaning, you know, 16 to 1, 10 to 1, but I'm not forecasting that right now. We kind of have to wait and see. But it's uh, different, the whole different uh, scenario going forward. And, you know, the basics are the most important, you know, food, shelter, water, warmth, you know, and a job. And um, there's going to be a lot of people that are displaced. So they're going to enact what they're already proposing, which is this, Universal basic income, just sit at home, we'll send you a check. Well, what does that do to the, to the value of money? It dilutes it even further. People may, without knowing anything about economics or economic history, will think, well, this isn't so bad. i got to live on a little bit less, but I can watch you know, TV, watch, catch up on my Netflix or whatever. I'm getting a check. And, but it'll only take about two or three months before it dawns on them that every time they go to the grocery store, they're getting less and less. And that's the one thing that everybody wakes up to is what their food budget looks like. Energy, too. Of course, oil, we haven't discussed, and I'm not an expert, although I wrote an energy letter for about a year, and I have looked into it rather deeply. And I do uh, talk with Steve San Angelo from time to time pretty in-depth because he's very studied in it. But, you know, with the oil market as it is, that is sort of the biggest flashing red light you can get. With the oil market in the critical situation we're in now, if that's telling us all in just screaming at us, we have some big problems ahead. You see oil at the price levels it's at. There's so much debt in the oil market. There's so much dependent. And without energy, nothing happens. The only reason we have the lifestyle we have is because of energy. And when you can buy a gallon of gas, and a gallon of gas represents, I forget, you know, how many man hours of physical labor People don't account for it that way. They complain that it's four bucks a gallon when you equate it to how many 
man labor hours it is, it's like hundreds. And that's, you don't take it for granted. You put it in your lawnmower and you push it around and, you know, but the equivalent work of a human being to equal the energy that's in that gallon is phenomenally large. And so it's a situation where I don't say I'm scared, but I am concerned. I don't want to be overly concerned. I want to stay kind of my level headed. I do get compliments from time to time that I don't overemphasize the doom side. I don't wish to do that. It's not my purpose, but it's also my duty to speak truthfully and honestly from my perspective, having looked at this for a long time, believe me, I'm not rooting for this. I never wanted to see it happen. In fact, I wanted to correct it and I'm going to digress a bit more. But I was nominated for a White House fellowship when I was uh, getting my master's degree. And, and I applied, and you had to write a policy paper. So my policy paper was how to correct the Social Security system. But the establishment doesn't want to hear anything about, you know, compound interest and how it works and that it's impossible to, to provide benefits to the Social Security system without, you know, some drastic but doable changes at that time. So I was rejected. I never got to the first round interviews. If I would have gone along and written some, you know, puff piece on some BS, I probably would have at least gotten to the first round for the interviews. But it's not about me. It's about the ideas, the policies, the integrity. It's that's what's important. It's not, I'm just giving the message. But this is the kind of world we're in. We just want to pretend everything's okay. Well, the pretend has ended. Remember Jim Sinclair, you know, pretend and extend. Well, the pretend is over, folks. The reality is leaking through. You can deny reality all you want. You just can't deny the consequences of reality. And it's here. It's now. And it's going to continue. Yeah. And I think it's such an important point that you make that um, no one is wishing for this to happen. But it's everyone's responsibility to warn people that might not be so clearly aware of the possibilities that these are in fact the possibilities that you need to prepare for if it doesn't happen that's awesome but if it does happen just the same way as it's happened to every empire that's ever existed on the planet just the same way as it's happened in many many countries throughout the world to think that we're completely immune while we watch our currency be printed in this outrageous way is just putting on blinders and uh, causing a situation where you're just going to wake up one day overnight unprepared. There were right. people that weren't even prepared for this, Dave. Um, I know. They didn't have their groceries. They didn't listen. Right. Yeah. Um, shout out to Michael Rupert, long deceased, but very good thinker. And I learned this from him, but when, uh, when Russia failed, basically both North Korea and uh, Cuba were basically dependent on, you know, their, their fiat to keep their economies going, you know, just give us universal basic income for the nation state and we'll feed our people barely. So when uh, they were failed, uh, North Korea basically had many people that starved to death. Sorry, folks, it's reality. If you don't want to hear this, go to a different channel. But Cuba did something different. They basically said, all right, all land is, is our land, you know, is your land, and just start growing food right now. So in Cuba, they basically, the population went out and started gardening like madmen. And they, after a while, actually had pretty better health because most of it's organic and that kind of thing. So two different approaches of the same problem. One was, you know, give me, money, give me free money and we'll continue. Oh, you can't give me free money, we starve. And the other attitude was, all right, we've got to change what, what, how we do things. Everybody start growing food. So, you know, and one prospered and one didn't. And I'm not, you know, I mean, I'm savvy enough to know you probably don't have as good a growing situation in North Korea as you do in Cuba, but nonetheless, there's ways to do it. I mean, you can do it indoors. Well, you know, there's ways to grow food. <laughs> Dave, um, I want to real quick get your opinion on the coronavirus. Do you think this was an overreaction or was it justified? Well, you know, I'm a big fan of uh, <clears throat> Peak Prosperity, Chris Martinson and his crew. And, you know, Chris, that's his expertise. It's not mine. And I am well aware of an exponential function, probably as well as Chris is. But I, at this point, would have to side with it's an overreaction. I could be wrong. I mean, the data will tell us eventually if this thing subsides, 
And, you know, we're back on track another two weeks to a month. And for whatever reason, fine. I'm, I'm, that's what I want. Um, but from my perspective, and I've looked at so many, you know, really way out there theories and stuff that, you know, mainstream John Hopkins University, of course, the CDC, you know, Chris's work and a lot. So sitting here, you asked, I'll tell you, I think it's an overreaction, but, you know, I, and I don't, I'm not afraid to be wrong. If I'm wrong, I'll come back on your show and say, no, I was wrong. But um, we'll see. You know, we're not really at that point in the curve where I could see like on a chart of gold going exponential or a bond market or something where I've got data that shows me and tells me, hey, <laughs> this thing is, you know, it's really going to go now. We're not there yet. We could be, but I'm right now still leaning to the uh, overblown. It's really? a tough balancing act. I mean, you, you know, like you said about the farm thing. I mean, th who's planting your crops right now? Nobody. Who's planting right now? Nobody. I mean, home gardeners are, you know, people that are smart enough to grow their own food. But as far as the commercial farms, I doubt they're doing anything right now. And the planting season, you know, is here now. And there's all kinds of problems in the food chain. Just too many to name. But anyway, I was long-winded on that, Michelle. Sorry. I want to give the right answer. I think basically it's overdone. Yeah, right. And what do you think of the president's reaction to this? Because this is certainly an unprecedented situation. No other president has been hit with something like this before. Look, I'm not a big Trump fan. I want to make that clear. I was asked in Canada before the election, if Trump got elected, what did I think? And my answer was... Well, it'd be like uh, switching the captain on the Titanic. I think it's the ship's going down, but if Trump gets elected, they'll bring the steerage up to first class. They'll have a little more lively music. People will feel a lot better. There'll be a lot of dancing and singing. Lots of people will be saying happy days are here again, but the ship's going down. So that was my exact answer. I think he's doing the best he can. Um, it's tough times for everybody, you know, the attitude of Americans is that, you know, now is that, you know, president's supposed to fix everything or he's the main reason things aren't fixed the way that they think they should be. Basically, our republic was supposed to be minimal government. We're supposed to be self-sufficient. They're supposed to be working for us. We're supposed to be able to go about our own lives, have total freedom within the bounds of natural law. We can't go hurting people. But, you know, we basically have all these freedoms. The government's supposed to protect those freedoms. It's basically a socialistic, fascist, top-down, centralized, bureaucratic, bloated, unresponsive, greedy bunch of SOBs that run the whole system now. But that's not what it was supposed to be. It's supposed to be limited. So if you really have a understanding of the way it was instituted at the beginning, the president's sort of like a figurehead. Doesn't do that much. But now everything's well, he didn't do this and he didn't do that. Well, one person could have a lot of influence, but they can't control a lot of these things when they're beyond their control. But yet people think he should have this or should have that, and it really has deep meaning. No, basically freedom means a freedom to discover yourself, to be your best, to actually contribute to society in a way that is most advantageous to both you and others. But we've lost all that. Integrity is something that was lost in uh, the Congress and the, and the Senate the whole political system has been lost in the medical structure. It's been lost in the legal system, the political system, and even in the uh, food chain, integrity has been lost. I mean, the amount of uh, chemicals and processed stuff, it's lost in uh, the pollution. You know, the amount of pollutants that China's allowed to spew into into the atmosphere and basically there's exemptions from the fracking where the water rights act is basically null and void doesn't matter if you pollute the water as long as you're fracking for more oil so we are really one messed up bunch of people running around on the surface of this rock and we've lost our way in so many ways and as i said nature has a way of you can't mess with mother nature and i think we're at that point yeah Right. Now, Dave, I can't let you go without asking your opinion on Bitcoin. Well, you know, I think I'll stay where, my, where I started. I wrote that article, my two bits about Bitcoin. I'm free market. Bitcoin's the way to go. I will say I don't have it in front of me, Michelle, but I wrote about it last month in the Morgan Report. And I said that it's pretty obvious to me that uh, from Mark Carney, 
that uh, the banking system obviously wants to stay in power. They want a, a global currency. They don't want it tied to anything, and they want it digital. They want to eliminate cash. But if you think that Bitcoin is what they're going to use, you have another thing coming. I think Bitcoin will exist, but any government entity, if they have a global currency that's digitalized, it won't be Bitcoin. So it's not that Bitcoin couldn't go up in you know relative value, whatever, but if you think that Bitcoin is going to be the solution, no, it's an open source. I mean, the government will basically take that software and use it to their own, put their own name on it. And then they have the power of the gun, you know, the legal power. You know, you can't use Bitcoin for, you know, rent, food or, you know, loans or whatever. You can only use the, you know, the Globo One or whatever they call it. So I'm not against Bitcoin. I'm for C- competing currencies. If you got a better idea for transferring labor to each other, that's great. I'm for it. Bitcoin certainly has shown its uh, ability to entice a lot of people. But uh, as far as, you know, if you think a government will adopt Bitcoin as the solution, no. The idea of a centralized, and they won't call it, it'll be centralized for them. Uh, digital currency, yeah, that'll happen. And what happens if Bitcoin as a consequence? Does it get outlawed entirely? Is it used? It won't be the main main one. So my thoughts on Bitcoin are kind of what they always have been, which is let the market determine it. But in the marketplace, Bitcoin, I think, has had its best days for a while. Will it go above roughly 20000 in USD? That depends on what kind of inflation we see in the future, because it's just a number. I mean, I'll have to leave you with this, Michelle. I know I'm looking down, but I got to pull one out of my desk here. But uh, one of my favorite topics with uh, the Zimbabwe note. Yeah. I yeah. gave that to my mother-in-law some time ago, and she looked at that $100 trillion and she goes, oh, if only it was real. I said it was real. Yeah. <laughs> it's the idea that if you have a one with a lot of zeros behind it, it makes you wealthy is a concept that doesn't work. It's the opposite. It's the opposite. It means your your currency has now just crashed yeah. completely. Yeah. Well, um, so you do believe that we are going into a digital um, cashless society. Um, well, you know, let me reframe that. I think I know that's the direction they want it to go. What I don't know is what the power of the people really is. I mean, the old adage, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. How much blowback is there going to be from people like me that will stand up and maybe, and I don't want to be a martyr, but what's worth dying for, you know? Um, So I don't know. I mean, they might try this, you know, you can't get on an airplane unless you have a vaccine kind of crap, but how many people are going to go along with it? Well, probably the majority, but the majority is in everything. Remember, the Revolutionary War was really fought with a very small percentage of people. And I think the turning point was uh, in the town hall with, uh, you know, the give me liberty or give me death. I mean, that speech was basically, as for you gentlemen, I do not know. But as for me, give me liberty or give me death. Because when he walked in before he gave his speech, they were basically saying, okay, we'll go along with the Brits. We'll be taxed to death, we'll be their slaves, we'll be subservient. We just don't want to have to fight. You know, most people in their heart of hearts aren't willing, don't want to, unless they're forced into it. He said, look, I'm not going to live as a slave. I'm willing to die for my freedom. And that, like, people got a, a new consciousness in that building. It's, you know what? He's right. I don't want to live like this. I have, I'm me. I'm a person. I have rights. I've got natural rights to be free. And I'm willing to fight for him. So I don't know where it's going to go. I'm certainly not saying revolution. I'm a huge Gandhi fan. There's one man that stood up to the British Empire and changed it. So, I mean, you know, can it be done again? I'm, let's say I'm idealistic enough to think it could be. Right. All throughout history, people have stood up. And I do think that um, the takeover of the banks, people will see it that way. If everything is digitalized, they will see it as a takeover of freedoms. If you, if the bankers who have a history of abusing their positions, um, Mm -hmm. losing all their money, quote unquote, and then we don't, as a society, for whatever reason, don't have the guts to say, okay, we need an audit. 
that's exactly what should have done what you know been done in, in 2008 when all the banks mm-hmm. said we lost your money then we need to say okay where did it go mm-hmm. and no one did that no one did that in fact what was what happened was we uh gave those same people more of our money um And I'm speaking in terms of our president, Obama did that at that time, but there was no audit, there was nothing. And I think that the generations coming up now, um, yourself, uh, everyone who is on the planet at this point in time who has a say, at this point will say, if you lost our money, show it, you know, show where it went. And if we're all going digitalized to the people that lost all of our money, I think that people will start to take a stand. I think that's true. I think the majority, I think you're right, might find it easier to not take a stand. Mm. But I think that those are, who are naturally inclined will. What do you think will happen? Oh, there'll be pushback. I don't know how great it'll be. And, you know, as long as we have the ability to communicate with each other, it's because, you know, a lot of my ideas might sound like my ideas, but it's because of this library behind me. And I've got the San Francisco Golden Gate Bridge behind me. But, you know, it's because people that I read or listened to or sat in their lectures or paid to attend their seminars or whatever, you know, I learned, I learned from them and I put these ideas and tested them or read more, whatever. So the point is that uh, we need each other and with the ability to communicate with uh, some, you know, top thinkers in how do we resist peacefully, we instrumental in providing a resistance to, their plot. Uh, if they cut us off, uh, it will be more difficult, but those who have it in their heart, have it in their soul, they won't give up. They will resist, but they might not have the benefit of pooling ideas together to come up with a maximum solution. And there isn't a one size fits, fits all. What works in you know certain areas wouldn't be the most advantageous in other areas, but even that could be discussed and uh, fine tuned, if you will. It's interesting that this has been a pattern of history, Dave, where we have societies, they're great, then we have takeovers attempted, then we have resistance, we have rebuilding, and it all starts again. You know what? It is always amazing to have you on this show, David. Please tell everyone a little bit about your reports and your website and where they can find you and follow your work. Sure. Uh, one I don't really mention too much, and I've got, I don't know, 35,000 or something followers on Twitter, and that's at SilverGuru22, so the at sign for all Twitter, it's SilverGuru, G-U-R-U-2-2. I post there pretty much myself. I let uh, a couple guys that work with me post there as well. It's usually me. So anything I see that I think is very pertinent to the situation that we're in, I'll post that. Then I do have a YouTube channel. I think that's the Morgan Report. You can just go to YouTube in their search uh, box and type in the Morgan Report. It'll pop up. I post a lot of, uh, I post every video like this that I do, but I also post ones from other people because I think they're, again, germane to our current situation. So maybe something from Chris Martinson. Um, This guy does uh, Silver Uncut, I think it's called. He's very good. I posted a few of his recently. And so, you know, that's, a, that's free information. Then the Morgan Report itself, I do a newsletter that's free. It's just on the, the main web landing page, themorganreport.com. Just put in a name and an email, verify it, you're in. And then for people that are serious about uh, investment opportunities, uh, can buy the paid report. And that's just the subscribe button. You can pull it down, see the video and uh, read about it and, uh, you know, come on board if you're so inclined. Yeah. And you always have some of the best lesser known um, options that turn out to be extraordinary for people that want to invest in precious metals. Mm -hmm. So you have some interesting stuff. Everybody needs to check this out. Um, Before we go, at this current time, mention something extraordinary outside of silver and gold um, physical holding. What would you recommend today? I'd recommend education. I think it's important during this time to reevaluate your priorities. You know, I measure people by what they have, not by what they have. And what that statement means is what's your head and heart like? What's your integrity like? That's more important than any amount of money you have. From day one to day now, I've signed off every issue of the Morgan Report with this statement. Wishing you health above wealth, wisdom beyond knowledge. 
no matter how much money you have, you can't buy your health back. You can delay it. You can get better. You might be able to make some intrusions, but basically health is something you have to earn. You know, I'm fit because I have to work at it. It doesn't come free. And then wisdom beyond knowledge. Wisdom means you've learned a lot of lessons in life and you learned how the world works. And it's best to work with the world than against it. Knowledge is great if you apply it, but unapplied knowledge is just knowledge. So you can know a lot and do nothing and not really be worth that much. So health above wealth, wisdom beyond knowledge. I'll leave you with that, Michelle. Beautiful. Thank you so much for coming on this show today. (laughs) My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Mr. David Morgan, precious metals expert and the founder of the MorganReport.com. For the industry experts panel, I'm Michelle Holliday at PortfolioWealthGlobal.com.